Peril TV, the voice for humanity. Hi, welcome to New York Parrot Literary Corner. My name is Dustin Pickering. I'm your host and anchor today. And we have today with us Wang Bing, who was born in Shanghai and came to USA in 1986. He is the founder and director of the Kinship of Rivers Project, an international project that builds kinship among people who live along the Mississippi, Yangtze, Anges, Amazons, Nile Rivers through exchanging gifts of arts, poetry, stories, music, dance, and food. She has paddled many rivers and their tributaries, giving poetry and art workshops along the river communities, making thousands of flags as gifts and peace ambassadors between the Mississippi and Yangtze rivers. Her publications include My Name is Immigrant, Life of Miracles Along the Yangtze and Mississippi, 10,000 Waves, American Visa, Foreign Devil, A Flesh and Spirit, Magic Whip, The Last Communist Virgin, New Generation, Poetry from China Today, Flashcards, and that's a co-translation with Ron Paget, Aching for Beauty, Footbinding in China, and The Last Communist Virgin, won the 2008 Minnesota Book Award and Asian American Studies Award. Her new poetry book, My Name is Immigrant, is long listed for the National Book Award, Critics Circuit Book Award, Penn Literary Award, Griffin International Poetry Prize, and among uh, many others. She's collaborated with the British filmmaker Isaac Yulian on 10,000 Waves, a film installation about the illegal Chinese immigration in London. A composer and musician Bruce Bolin, Alex Wand, and Gao Hong, etc. And Wang Ping taught creative writing as professor of English at McAllister College for 21 years, is now Professor Emeritus. Thank you for joining us today, uh, Wang. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you for inviting me. What, By the what? Way, my name is Ping. Okay, I'm sorry, Ping. sorry. I got your name backwards, Ping. No, Thank so, you. No, it's not backwards. It's uh, the right way, Chinese uh, way. Okay, yeah. gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Okay, so you know, my first my first question is that it's a little little background research to, to get some ideas about what to ask, and uh, I found it fascinating that you taught yourself uh, early on and in, in, uh, during the uh, Cultural Revolution in China. Uh, how did that come about? And can you tell us a little bit about the process of self teaching? Oh well, I was forced into it because um, the Cultural okay. Revolution there was like no no school and. Um, when school opened off and on, most of us just did, you know, uh, farming, military training, factory working, and which actually is not a bad training, actually. And you learn a lot from your hands, right? Handing work. But I was just so thirsty for books, and uh, most of the books were banned. And so I started forming. You know, uh, actually, one day I activated a box of books my mom hid under the chicken coop, and and I used that as a seed, that bo uh, box of books as seed to start uh, trading underground, and we had our own underground book club with mm -hmm. my friends, and um, because we don't really have, we just read whatever books we could uh, get. So so my knowledge is just pretty much, you know, whatever we could, we could right. do, right? And uh, so that kind of like, I believe because of that education, um, my way of thinking is very different from like there's only one way and the systematic like public school training mm -hmm. and um, it's very difficult to break that actually because I just watched my two sons going through that system gradually I realized how lucky I was actually I had no school you know uh, I just like taking care of my family cooking all day trying to find food and catch fish and you know uh, my brother would shoot birds, you know, to, to, and we have to grow our own vegetables and hatch our own chickens and everything had to be just like hunted, foraged, right? And um, so all the food, basically, my job was to, like, 
get the food, cook the food, take care of the family, and get the books to read. Uh, so right. You know, that's my education growing up. Interesting. So it's, it's, it's you think it was more tedious to, to self teach than, than to teach in the schools, or from your observation? I don't know. I, because I didn't go through the K to 12, you know, mm-hmm. education. Um, you know, I longed to go to school as a kid so much, you know, so everything. And when I was very young, little, um, you know, first time I heard the story of Little Mermaid on the mm-hmm. radio, um, I just wanted to go to college. But then school was closed. So so that was my major focus, just like, just study as much as I could, however I could, so I could get into the college, even though the college was closed at the time, right? And the college didn't open till 1977. Mm-hmm. The first experimental, they only admitted a few kids, and um, and um, that was the year also uh, seventy yeah seventy seven. I was admitted into a language school in the most beautiful city of China, Hangzhou, to study English, and um, so I learned English from that a year and a half training. That's my first formal school. And uh, then I, because of my great, good grades, I stayed and as a teacher. Then I pre- started preparing for my college exam. Mm-hmm. And because I have no training in math or chemistry in science, so I had to give up that, you know, it's like two legs, right? You know, one leg is science, one leg is humanity. and because I have no schooling, so I couldn't really teach myself the science. So I just did the humanity and I gave up all the, all the, all the credits from science and I tried to get as much, you know, credits from the humanity, right? And right. so basically other people have two legs, I have one leg and miraculously I hopped into the best university, Beijing University, on my on one leg. <laughs> so that was quite a, a miracle. I was stunned when I saw oh. the mission. Uh, so that was really fun. But the preparing for it was uh, really difficult. You know, mm-hmm. full time, I had no books to study because like all the materials were just so scarce. You know, so I just again, I just scramble you know, hustle, whatever I could. I remember <clears throat> getting up like three o'clock every morning, uh, memorizing, reciting, like all the stories, like little sister Carrie, sister Carrie, you know, plays in, in the sun and Jack London's, you know, those books and, and also uh, Huckleberry Finn. So I basically like there was no materials to study English, right? So I just like memorized texts from those books. Oh, wow. You know, and I just got into Beijing University. I don't know how I got there. <laughs> so, yeah. Interesting. Um, so yeah. another interesting story was when you first came to the United States and you walked into a creative writing uh, class yeah. by accident, actually, yeah. from what I understand. Uh, can you tell us about that? How did that feel? It was very, of course, yes. very yeah. strange. Well, um, you know, um, I was supposed to take uh, 18th century novel, mm-hmm. uh, Clarissa and uh, Tristy Shandon, uh, um, Tristy Shandy. And, um, and I was just dreading it because I knew that professor was very strict and a little bit mean, and I'm not going to get good grades from him. And I was just moaning, right? And uh, then I walked into the classroom and the professor looked a little bit like very, a little bit crazy. (laughs) (laughs) He had like a very long, wild hair. And, uh, you know, he had like whitewashed, the paint just splashed all over his clothing. 
and he had like two shirts and both shirts were like misbuttoned and uh, he had a cold he had a running nose and he was borrowing tissues from student mm. I'll never forget that image and I just thought wow that is a very interesting 18th century professor right mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so I sat down and quickly I realized it's a creative writing class I said, mm. all right, let me just try it. And I actually did the first assignment and um, the professor wrote, you should start writing a novel. Mm. And his name is Lewis Walsh. He just passed away recently. And uh, so I was just like, you know, Zen master or Tibetan uh, Buddhist master just hit you on your on top of your head, mm -hmm. wake up, right? <laughs> so that was like the moment you said, Oh, that is why I'm here in, all the way from China to New York to do this to tell my story. You know, it's very difficult to come to America at that time, which is very, mm -hmm. very few people, you know, uh, in the 80s, right? I had to jump through so many hoops to get here. Mm -hmm. So one difficulty after the next, but you managed to surmount all that. Yeah, and I managed to walk into the wrong classroom. <laughs> and then that is the only creative writing class I took ever. Right. Interesting. Uh, yeah. And then Professor pretty soon introduced me to Allen Ginsberg, who was looking for an interpreter for his Chinese American liter uh, poetry festival. Mm -hmm. So yeah, of course I jumped at the opportunity, even though there was no money involved. Right. And even though I was really starving myself, right? You know, I was working as a waitress um, under the table to get a few like tips, a few dollars of tips. And I wasn't very good actually, <laughs> you know? Mm. And, um, I was good with people, but I was terrible with like counting money and, you know, doing these little things that often, you know, sometimes I will forget to ask them to sign the credit card. And, uh, and then, you know, like 80 or $90 meal, I had to pay for it. You know, that was like my whole week wow. like income, right? So, yeah, I wrote quite mm -hmm. a few stories about that. So, but then I was just like poetry because of the poetry festival. I got to know, I got to work with Alan for several months, really close, right? And then I met the best poets from China and the best poets from America, like Alan Ginsberg, John Ashbery, you know, Gary Snyder, Robert Creeley, all these giants, right? People I never really heard of it, you know. Mm -hmm. and I got to just got to know them and travel with them and interpret and translate for them, you know. So Fighting. that's when I started writing poetry. Mm -hmm. you know, I was writing stories already at that time. And then I started writing poetry and also started writing a novel at the same time. So, uh, you know, I was looking through some of the poems in My Name is Immigrant, and you seem to kind of combine poetry with a lot of sociological observations. And, and uh, what, what, what prompted that? Like, you know, there's a lot of cultural histories and stuff in there. Right. Well, I, well, I write in all genres, right? And um, I feel sometimes like poetry, the story in poetry itself is not enough. So I felt I need to give it some background mm -hmm. and afterwards. So that's when the lyrical prose or lyrical story comes in. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder if that, you know, interrupts the poetry or it, does it help poetry? That's my question for you since you read it. I did read some of it and I don't, I think it flowed very well, actually. I, I, I don't think it was interrupting at all. It was very, it gives a little bit of a, an interesting uh, flavor to it. Okay, thank you. Well, I don't know, just like, do you think without those stories, do you think the poems 
I could get rid of those stories. Oh no, I think it, it gives a very strong background taste to the uh, to the whole the whole work as a whole. I mean, it's it's interesting because it becomes an experience rather than just you know a typical sort of confessional narrative style piece. You know, uh, that's out a lot of that's out there. You 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 know you get a little background and and a more it adds to the experience of reading it. I think. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, you know, one of the one of the lines that I found in there that um, I, I really found interesting, and uh, if you want to want to elaborate on this a little bit, what you're referring to here, I wrote this down. We know each survival is a miracle. We know our miracle is backed by thousands of unfulfilled dreams. Mm -hmm. The dead are never dead. They live through us. They sing their stories through our mouths and hands, and we have work to do. Yeah. Uh, that's that's beautiful. I love that 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 phrase. And I'm wondering when you say well, we have work to do, what are what are you referring to there? Well, just I keep writing to tell right. stories, right? And because they are dead, so I have to pick up their voice and sing for them, you know, because they can no longer sing, right? Right. Yeah. So. Telling the story of yeah. ancestry yes. and immigrants. Right. People all over the world American history and the, the reality of america what, right what made of america right you know what america is made of right right of course yeah. um so you also did um a uh multimedia presentation called behind the gate after the flood of the three uh three again what is it Three gorgeous. Sorry, I was going to say three gorgeous. Three gorgeous. Yeah, I was curious about that because I, I did a little reading on the three gorgeous dam. What what brought you to interest in that? Uh, what is my interest? Um, well, that was the biggest dam mm -hmm. in the world, and uh, I knew immediately it will have huge impact, right? You know. Mm -hmm. uh, agriculturally, culturally, economically, and uh, geographically and geology, geologically, because that's, they just suddenly create a lake equivalent to Lake Superior, mm -hmm. right, over a few years of period. And in reality, yes, it caused huge, like constant landslide, landslides. Mm -hmm and uh, just snowstorm earthquake right and um, and about three million people were displaced a lot of towns and cultures to try in that area right three gorges has like the history the human track human archaeology right and went back all the year like fifty thousand years way back mm -hmm. right and uh, suddenly it's all underwater in a way it's not too bad because actually it seals all the archaeology sites very well mm -hmm. it would be actually safer underwater right <laughs> then like on the ground like anyone can just go in you know but china now is doing a really good job protecting those archaeology, you know, um, mm -hmm. history. But, um, but my main interest is people, right? Those people right. who are going to be displaced. And those people have been living there for like hundreds, if not thousands of years, right? People from Sichuan, they are like a homebound. They are like very home-oriented people. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a new actually, you know, their history may even like they, the local people's history may even be longer than like Han Chinese, mm -hmm. like from the Yellow River, even much longer, because of the new archaeology they just dug out, like the three star, uh, mount, and uh, so all the like. You know, um, the bronze and the gold and and the shapes of you on the face, right? Masks just make people wonder, like, how long has, you know, are they aliens, right? And uh, 
you know, other, they are not very much at all like the Chinese Han people, the Finnish mm. people, right? Interesting. And, yeah, so people start like, they are wondering like if, like, they, if they actually were com connected with Sumer, Sumer uh, mm -hmm. culture and like, and, you know, if Sumer culture and with those Sichuan, you know, uh, sites, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and the site in India, they are trying to connect us and see if actually they were life from the Earth or if they actually from other planets or stars. You know, hmm. so interesting. Really interesting. Yeah. yeah. Fascinating. Because, because they are like just really amazing, like facial, the eyes just like, like, and they, they know the skills to like, to open like, the, like a hole, right? And let it grow like a huge, like something just sticking out their forehead, you hmm. know? and then their eyes become blind so everything they see is through this metal thing that's sticking out like one or two feet you know wow <laughs> it's like antenna right fascinating that's that's very interesting it's stuff that you don't hear about a lot on a lot of the you no, know no. you should look don't hear it. about that it's called three star mm -hmm. uh, three star pile from Sichuan the new the uh you know, discovered. It was actually discovered 15 years ago when I went back, but they excavated even more now around that area. Oh, that's very, that's interesting. It's really yeah. fascinating. It's, it's like a huge, like, discovery in archaeology, you know. So I wondered if you had a, a poem or two to share with us, if you were prepared for that. Say it again? You have a poem or two to share with us. Sure. I have to bring it because I I have no I should have asked you like what would you like me to do but I will... something whatever you'd like you think would be you know uh, that you would enjoy read. This is the Parrot Literary Corner. For those out there viewing, subscribe to the channel and tell others about us. We're looking for writers of any kind, whether you're established or lower on the ground, trying to build your way up, we'll give you a platform. Okay, so I will read um, Things We Carry on the Sea, just a mm -hmm. poem that opens the whole book. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. That's fine. Yeah. Things we carry on the sea. We carry tears in our eyes. Goodbye, father. Goodbye, mother. We carry soil in small bags. May home never fade from our hearts. We carry names, stories, memories of our village, our civilization. We carry scars from proxy wars of greed. We carry carnage of mining, droughts, floods, genocide. We carry dust of our families, incinerated in mushroom clouds. We carry our islands sinking under the sea. We carry our hands, feet, bones, hearts, and best minds to start a new life. We carry diplomas, medicine, engineer, nurse, education, math, poetry even if they mean nothing to the other shore. We carry railroads, plantations, laundromats, taco trucks, farms, factories, nursing homes, hospitals, schools, temples, built on our ancestors' backs. We carry old homes along the spine, new dreams in our chests. We carry yesterday, today, and tomorrow. We are orphans of the wars forced upon us. We are refugees of the sea, drowning in plastic wastes. We came home 
We came from the same mother in Africa. We are your children, sisters, brothers, father and mother. Our tongues carry the same weight as we chant. I, help, lead, amor, love, ping an, shalom, shalom, pass, peace, xi wang, amal, hafnan, esperanza, hope, 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 as we drift from dream to dream, sea to sea. Mm -hmm. A very uh, world-oriented poem, and of course, of, of the subject matter. It's, I love that. It's beautiful. Thank you. Very welcome. So an another um, work of yours is Aching for Beauty, but binding in China. What uh, prompted that uh, for you to explore that theme? Oh, it uh, came out of my uh, PhD <laughs> program from NYU, and I was studying... I was taking a class called uh, uh, Taboos and Transgression mm -hmm. uh, from a very well-known professor and, uh, and we had to do a presentation. So I chose foot binding uh, to, to present to the class. And uh, as a child, I, you know, my feet grew very fast, right? So it just quickly, when I was like, eight or nine, my feet were already size six, right? And that was just considered like, no, 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 you're ugly kind of sign, right? So my parents like often just say, laugh at my feet as like boats, they call them boats, right? Or ships, you know? So <laughs> I try to like stop up my feet from growing by binding it without knowing anything about foot binding right and also my grandma had bound feet mm -hmm. right even though she let go her feet and it was still completely like deformed because all the bones were broken mm -hmm. and i just watched her walk in a very funny way all her life right and uh, so she can only walk on her heels, right, basically. So all the toes were broken and folded under the soles since she was okay. five, six years old. Yeah. What's so the history of that? What's the history of, the, you know, the cultural history behind the foot binding? Oh, well, it's just, um, actually it was bound loosely to, um, uh, by a uh, emperor's dancing dancer and and she bound her feet into the shape of new moon and danced mm. on a golden lotus stage right gilded mm. with gold you know so mm -hmm. then all the other ladies became like they began to do the same to win the favor from the emperor and mm. then Gradually, it just spread from the palace, you know. It had over a thousand years of history. Oh. Yeah, it was like by the 19th, yeah, like from, from 14, yeah, uh, I think from like 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, uh, like, for about 800 years, foot binding was just so widespread among Chinese women, you know, and it became a must for the girls in order to find a husband. Wow. Yeah. So it's so, sort of one of those ways that uh, the uh, male dominance affects women and standards well, of beauty. Then, then women be took it over, actually. It became their power. Hmm. And there's, uh, if you read the book, actually one chapter uh, talked about woman, female writing, right? It's a footbound woman gathered to embroider shoes, right? And also they invented their own language, right? The secret hmm. woman language, you know, to, hmm. yeah. And 
man couldn't even like touch it by uh, like like as a messenger they can't even do that you know mm. so it gives them a lot of power you know secrecy you know and uh, so yeah it it is their way of like social climbing too if you have a pair of nice bound nicely bound feet you can actually marry into a good family Hmm, that's fascinating. It's a but most women terrible history, still, though, too. Most women, most women still had to work. Like my grandma, she had to work in the fields with her bound feet. So that's like a lifelong pain. Right. You know. Yeah. Wow. We have about uh, seven minutes or so. Um, is there anything you'd you know, like to say to the audience, the, the viewers that are related to writing or education, anything, a message you'd like to impart? Mm, I don't know. I just feel poetry is universal and mm -hmm. um, is part of life, right? And poetry literally saved my life many, many times. And I wouldn't be standing here if not for the poetry. So, and I hope like, and immigrants, right? I was literally told like my English was like second grade English. There was no way I could get my work published. And uh, I was about to uh, that, you know, my fiance from Canada told me, and actually he convinced me to take GIE. Uh, and I actually got into the MBA, McGill University. Mm -hmm. So I was on the verge of going to Montreal to get married and become a businesswoman. And the last minute I decided not to go to be oh, wow. a starving poet in New York. Because mm -hmm. like I had no immigration status, right? You know. Mm -hmm. So I had like about eight months to get myself a job so I could stay in America. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I just yeah, but jobs was like I, I, like I have no, you know, I had like eight months work visa, right? After I graduated from, you know, Long Island University. And if I don't get a job, and and if the job wouldn't give me, um, like sponsor me for work visa, then I have to go back. Right and everything was impossible. Like trying to go to college when the college wasn't even open. When trying to take the entrance exam, when you didn't get schools, right? <laughs> but it just happened. And it just, I remember barging into the Board of Education in New York City. And I just said, here's my problem. And I would like to have a job. I'd like to be a teacher. And they were shocked, right? And they were just truly shocked. Like, who is this person? You know? Did you write a story about how the uh, Chinese passport renewal has evolved? Oh, I wrote a story. It's called The Dangerous Woman in, of America. Mm -hmm. That's my mm -hmm. book story. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a different, yeah, that's a different story. What's, can you give us a kind of rundown? sort of like a, uh, a summary, you know, tell the story a little bit. Oh, well, I just like, I have to renew my passport, but nowadays the passport photo is so difficult. Mm -hmm. like every country has its own like requirements for size, color, you know? Mm -hmm. So now the like, I usually go to Walgreens, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, it has to be very specific, like places to get the so-called professional passport photos. And so I went to Walgreens, and um, the first place, like they said, we don't have the the screen, the the white background. I think they deliberately destroyed it so they didn't have to deal with it because it's real pain in the neck. So I went to the second Walgreen, 
and um, and they reluctantly did it for me and charged me a lot of money and uh, then the embassy said no it's it didn't pass so I started looking for the right person right place to take my photo and just everyone shook their head like we don't know how to do it we don't know how to do it go to the next mm -hmm. room go to the post office just like the ball just pass on to next and next until I went to a Walgreen in the countryside right so I'm writing a series of stories about America's countryside the so-called rednecks right right the population that voted for Trump, right? <laughs> and they were so vilified. You know? Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Right, right. And my own experience is like they're just people. You know? Yeah, and yeah. They be treated as people with respect, and they are workers, right? And mm -hmm. So I went there. I just passed by, and my friend, like, like the place near Red Wings, it's a small town, and my friend said why don't you try your luck in that place i said no way it's this like countryside you know like like the walgreen people in the big cities they couldn't deal with it how could this place deal with it right? mm -hmm. but he made me go in so i went in and see i said there's like where's the passport machine right you know i don't even know if they have photo service service but actually they did, they do have passport service. And, uh, and then I told my, diff I told the girls, right. My difficulties, like my ear don't stick out and <laughs> passport requirement is the ears has to be shown. Right. So the girls started like bringing me like cotton balls or gauze and tape, chat make my ears sticking out so we just have that's a funny so yeah, we have yeah. less than a minute so we'll have to close the show but that's a very entertaining story and thank you thank you for sharing it it's been nice talking with you bang um this is the new york parrot literary corner and i'm justin pickering and please if you would like to donate anybody listening in uh it's the uh, paypal.me slash ny parrot and uh please subscribe to our channel we're doing the one million subscriber channel to our uh, channel here and we would like to have you as a subscriber thank you very much for being again thank you to our viewers and uh hopefully you have a nice day and please tell others about us and uh invite others to uh you know be on the station we're doing this business platform